Right. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. My name is John Brooks and I'm going to be your host this evening. Uh, we have two amazing cardiologists who we're going to talk to tonight. Um, we're going to talk about something very amazing. Actually, we're going to talk about something that Washington State University calls the most extraordinary therapeutic and most extraordinary preventative breakthrough in the history of medicine. Okay, and so joining us tonight is Dr. Pratishka Gandhi and Dr. Mark Gordon. We're going to start with Dr. Gandhi. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about her. Dr. Gandhi uh, is a global healthcare leader, preventive cardiologist, uh, with a mission to eradicate cardiovascular disease by preventing heart attacks and reversing heart disease using non-evasive, cost-effective treatments. Uh, she was India's first woman preventive cardiologist and founder of IPC, which is the Institute of Preventive Cardiology, which she founded in 1999 in Mumbai. And she pioneered the concept of preventive and non-invasive cardiology, for which she was applauded by the late president of India, Dr. Kalam. And some more about Dr. Gandhi. She, she's amazing. Uh, she, uh, under her leadership, IPC centers have treated more than 50,000 cases, which uh, involve international cases as well, with a 95% success rate. Uh, she is the CEO of her established IPC heart care center in the U.S. in Southern California. In 2016, the International Association of Cardiologists in New York recognized her as the leading physician of the world. And also, she was uh, recently awarded top 50 global woman healthcare leader in March of 2017. So with that, and then also I'm gonna tell you about Dr. Dr. Mark Gordon as well. Dr. Mark Gordon is an expert and an international leader in NERV2 technology. Um, Dr. Gordon, FACC is a board certified cardiologist with 20 years of experience in cardiology. He completed his medical training at the University of Minnesota and participated in multiple pharmaceutical and medical device trials as a clinical cardiologist. He served as governor for the state of South Dakota for the American College of Cardiology and was the director of medical education at the Avera Heart Hospital during his tenure there. Dr. Gordon has always had an interest in preventative medicine and has completed the fellowship program in anti-aging and regenerative medicine through the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine and at the University of South Florida School of Medicine. He completed advanced training in metabolic cardiology through the Metabolic, Med excuse me, metabolic Medicine Institute through George Washington University School of Medicine. Mark's passion for prevention has fueled his desire to pursue a preventative and integrative cardiology clinic in the future. So with that, welcome Dr. Gandhi and Dr. Gordon. Thank you, John. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with questions. As, as global healthcare leaders in preventive cardiology, what advice, we'll start with Dr. Gandhi first, in preventive cardiology, what advice would you offer to people to prevent heart ailments? Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, uh, welcome everybody. It's great to have you all on this uh, show. Uh, and uh, I'm so fortunate and blessed that uh, John Brooks <laughs> and Dr. Gordon reached out to me for this amazing breakthrough which we're going to share today. So uh, because I was always searching out for something new and we're going to talk all about uh, especially with the focus on the heart today so that uh, I think all of you have a heart, right? Nobody's heartless. So <laughs> all, of, all of you uh, who need to keep their heart uh, strong, young and fit uh, need to know this. So uh, keep your eyes, ears and all your senses open. Now, uh, coming back to that, why prevention is important. We all know that it is the number one, uh, the heart disease is number one killer and almost 40% of the deaths in the world are because of a heart problem. And uh, since uh, this is, we are talking specifically to the US today, uh, if you look right now, uh, okay, if you look 725,000 people are getting heart attacks every year. It looks very small compared to the 343 or 350 million population what we have. But the point is that 69 million adults in US 
have got their heart age, which is five years older than what you are, right? So all of you check yourself, like what is your age and what is your heart inside, you know? You can go to cdc.gov, okay, which is the uh, Center for Disease Control is a government uh, website which educates you. So you can go and look at your heart age over there. So there is a calculator over there. So just go and whenever, like after this, go and check yourself whether you, you are and your heart it's matching or it's older because as per the statistics, 50% of the men in US have got a heart age uh, five years more than what their age is and almost 40% of the women, okay? And uh, almost 75% of the heart uh, attacks and strokes are caused, I mean, the, because of the risk factors who have got a uh, heart age which is older. So I think that we need to prevent now. All of you must have understood the importance of prevention because, uh, uh, I, I, I'm so proud of Dr. Mark here because it, it takes real courage that as an interventional cardiologist, you know, like what he has been doing for last 20 years has been fixing heart attacks, you know, and uh, uh, today it's like a lot of glamour. You wear a mask, you're paid well, you're in a hospital and, you know, like people treat you, oh, you saved my life. But the point is that all the people in the community, that's what our goal is. We are reaching out to the people now in the community that why you want to wait and reach a state of point where you are doing firefighting. We put smoke detectors at home and we have alarms and we have this. So why we are not having detectors inside our heart system, which will help us. So today we're going to talk a lot about that. So for the prevention, I will just quickly uh, tell you that what tips or not, what we talk is that especially the prescription or what we say like like a general advice for a younger heart most important is that you should know your numbers you know you should have your blood pressure you should check your blood pressure it should be less than 120 AD check your cholesterol or your blood work you can work with your doctor on lowering that work on your diabetes especially a lot of people are in the pre-diabetics you know so we can work on that insulin resistance then a uh, tobacco use uh, we should avoid the tobacco use or avoid the secondhand smoke most important is the diet, you know, the diets what we are having. Uh, we encourage more of home cooked meals or uh, like a low, uh, like low fat vegetarian diet, which is very, very good for the heart. Most important is physical activity, like almost 150 minutes per week. And obviously having a healthy weight, you know, know your BMI and keep it healthy, like around 23 is good. So uh, just a quick, uh, <laughs> and I think Dr. Gordon can also share more. <laughs> Certainly. Yeah. So getting, getting back to your question, John, about, um, you know, what can you do to prevent cardiovascular disease? In the fellowship that I did in anti-aging medicine, one of my mentors, his name is Dr. Mark Houston out of Vanderbilt in Nashville, very bright guy. And he, he has this saying that there's three finite responses of the artery to an infinite number of stressors. And those finite responses are inflammation, oxidative stress and immune dysfunction. So what he means by that is that the blood vessels in your body respond to things, be it high blood pressure, be it um, small little micro tears in the wall of the artery, things like that. They respond to that in, in an attempt to heal the problem. But oftentimes this healing process is over exaggerated and that's what actually leads to, say, the buildup of plaque in arteries. When your immune system is out of control, when your inflammation in your body is out of control, and when your oxidative stress is out of control, it causes that healing process to, to function in a maladaptive way. And instead of making a nice, smooth, healing um, scar over, say, the tear in the micro part of the artery, uh, it causes this, this big cholesterol plaque to build up. Um, so, you know, we always thought that it was just cholesterol that led to cardiovascular disease, but it's really much, much more than that. Um, and Dr. Gandhi can attest to this, that the standard lipid test that people do here in the United States doesn't really help that much because it gives you, it's kind of gives you the 30,000 foot view, but you really need to dig deeper. And specifically what you need to look at is the oxidized LDL the LDL cholesterol that is oxidized. And a standard lipid panel does not do that. You have to get an expanded lipid, lipid panel to do that. The oxidized LDL is the nasty stuff. That's the stuff that gets into the wall of the artery and starts to form that plaque. 
And the reason it's oxidized is because the oxidative stress in that individual is high for whatever reason. There could be a number of reasons. Poor exercise, poor diet, other chronic inflammatory conditions that might be going on in the person's body at the time. Um, it's well known that people with autoimmune diseases have higher levels of coronary artery disease because their inflammation all throughout their body is much, much higher. And so that accelerates the process of forming plaques in the arteries. So standard cardiovascular treatment basically is, I, I tell people, if you need a muffler, you go to Midas, because you're gonna get a muffler if you go to Midas, right? If you, ha if you go to a cardiologist, you're probably gonna get a stent. But Dr. Gandhi and I would like to do everything in our power to pr try to prevent people from getting stents, okay? And there are ways that you can do that uh, through integrative uh, health care, through diet, exercise, lifestyle changes, and so forth. And that's kind of the goal that Dr. Gandhi and I have, is to try to help people get through this process without winding up with a bunch of hardware in their heart. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so Dr. Gandhi, perhaps you could talk a little bit about the role of, say, inflammation, oxidative stress, and and what you've done and, and what you see as a potential therapy for that. Absolutely. Actually, uh, as you rightly said, that uh, standard care, according to me, is no care because we are missing out on a lot of the cases. And currently, there are a lot of uh, pitfalls and gaps in the diagnosis and the treatment. And as we see that, uh, uh, as you rightly said, that even after doing angioplasty or bypass, the the blockages are coming back. That's what we always, you know, see. So because we are not able to go to the root cause, that is the inflammation and oxidative stress. And uh, till now, I think all these years, we just knew that we have to eat right or exercise or diet and all that. But uh, the NRF2 activation uh, is such a powerful technology and it's a real, real new breakthrough in medicine, what the Washington State University, the results are. So uh, let us let us a little bit talk about at uh, let, let's uh, go to the cellular level that uh, we we have all studied in high school biology that uh, the cell has got mitochondria which is the powerhouse of the cell and uh, there are a lot of uh, in the production of the energy there are a lot of free radicals you know which are excreted in the cell. And when we are young, there is a good healthy balance, uh, which is there of the antioxidant uh, enzymes, which are secreted, which combat the free radicals, you know. But as we age, uh, somewhere uh, this uh, gets uh, lessened and oxidative stress increases and not only heart, but I think all the diabetes, which is one of the uh, biggest risk factors actually in heart problem. Uh, what we call uh, 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 the other diseases also related. I'm not getting because we are we are putting mainly to the heart. But the point is that uh, it is very important to reduce this oxidative stress. And one of the main reason why the blockage begins is like as you said, the nasty little guy, oxy small oxidized LDL, which actually should be tested. That is also happening because of uh, oxidative stress. So when uh, when uh, uh, the NRF2 protein messenger is activated uh, in our body uh, through the right ingredients uh, uh, which are administered, then it can go and uh, it goes and it's like a messenger, you know, it's like goes to the nucleus and then it goes and uh, uh, knocks on the genes and the good genes which will produce these enzymes. Uh, start getting regulated and a lot of these anti-inflammatory genes get activated, anti-fibrotic. So all these genes uh, start getting activated. And what I love about the NRF2 technology is that it is so natural because I always believed in something like uh, I, I have actually a tagline that heal your heart naturally. You know, So I feel that uh, this technology is so powerful because it, it, this is something which I've been talking for 20 years and I think that law of attraction brought me this uh, breakthrough in medicine that uh, this NRF2 activation will now go and actually correct your body's uh, wrong things which were happening and make it right so that your body it starts healing itself and starts working on uh, your cardiovascular system in a very positive manner. Mm -hmm. that, that's excellent. And so... The thing to point out is, you know, this NRF2 protein that we're talking about, it's not just effective on the walls of the arteries, it's effective all throughout the heart and all throughout the body Absolutely. for that matter. But since we're talking about the heart tonight, 
Um, there are studies that you can go read on PubMed about NRF2 activation and the protective effect that it has on the lining of the coronary arteries, the endothelium, um, on the heart muscle cells itself, um, on the electrical system of the heart, and so forth. And so some of the studies, in fact, looked at the protective effect on heart muscle cells in a condition called pulmonary hypertension and how it could prevent the development of congestive heart failure on the right side of the heart related to the pulmonary hypertension. Perhaps, Dr. Gandhi, you could just give an explanation to the audience what pulmonary hypertension is and why that's such a bad thing and, and why it's important to protect your heart. Yeah, especially pulmonary hypertension is, uh, uh, is, is not a good condition to have because the patients uh, suffer a lot in that. And actually, we have this uh, uh, study where uh, NRF2 helps uh, this kind of conditions. And especially in our clinics too, we uh, see a lot of heart failure patients, you know. And uh, right-sided heart failure is very, very difficult, almost impossible with medical management. And I think that NRF2 is really a, a boon, you know, to uh, like uh, for this kind of uh, patients as for the study results. Right. Additionally, there was another study on saphenous veins. And uh, for those yeah, of you well, that, yeah. that are familiar with saphenous veins, it's the vein that they take out of the leg that they use for bypass grafts. It's kind of the conduit material that they use. But the problem with using veins as bypass grafts is veins are small, uh, or excuse me, thin walled vessels. They were never designed to carry highly oxygenated blood or high pressure blood. And so the walls of the veins respond poorly when they're switched from a venous conduit to an arterial conduit. And what ends up happening is all of that shear stress on the inside wall of that vein over time leads to the buildup of what I call grunge. It's not the same as cholesterol plaque that builds up inside arteries, but it's this grunge that builds up and leads to blockage and ultimately failure of the bypass graft. And uh, in one of the studies, they found that NRF2 activation could completely halt that process. Absolutely. And that's a critically important thing for, for patients that have had bypass surgery. Yes, and I would like to add that there was a study done in Denmark where they actually had this 500,000 population and they checked out that who had done bypass surgeries and they found that after 10 years, actually the death rates started uh, skyrocketing almost to 60 to 80 percent on people who had uh, finished 10 years of bypass surgeries. And as you said, that conclusion was the same thing that the graphs which were put in, they started getting clogged again. And uh, so most of the times uh, the surgery lasts for five to 10 years and people have to go through. So like there's a trend in Australia, like people have to do two times, three times and redo surgeries. So uh, th that is where I feel that uh, NRF2 activation technology can help a lot of patients after even angioplasty or a bypass because uh, 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 because the audience has to understand that angioplasty or bypass are just temporary methods to increase the blood supply to the heart. It doesn't take away the process of oxidative stress or you know inflammation which is happening in the body that is a root cause you know so uh, that is where all these people need help with this new technology to safeguard themselves. Right, I agree. And so many people, after they've had a stent or bypass surgery, think, oh, I'm fixed, I'm done, I don't have to worry about anything anymore. And it's like, no, that's just the beginning because from this point forward, you're gonna be at higher risk for more blockages developing. And if you're not proactive right now and do something to prevent further blockage by reducing that inflammation and that oxidative stress, you're gonna be right back here in a few months or years and you're gonna to have to have more blockage, right? Yes. And so that's a tough thing to get through people's head. And it, it always drove me crazy when I would have patients that would come in after perhaps a heart attack and a stent and they were still smoking. It's like, what part of this do you not understand that smoking is massively increasing your inflammation and your oxidative stress? So, right, it, we, we need to do a better job of educating. So my epiphany, so to speak, occurred oh, probably 15 years ago when I decided I wanted to get more into prevention. And that was, I got called in at two o'clock in the morning, a 35 year old guy was having a heart attack. So what do you do? You rush him to the cath lab, you put in a stent. And as we were preparing this guy to get uh, ready to do the angiogram, I just said to myself, we have got to do a better job at preventing uh, heart attacks. We have to do a better job at preventing heart disease because 35 year olds are not supposed to be having heart attacks. So 
uh, you know, the Western uh, culture, the standard American diet is just, it's horrible. And we need to do a better job at educating everybody. Absolutely. And actually what you face over there, actually in India, the problem is that the, the patients are getting the disease 10 years younger because of the stature and the size of the coronary arteries, as you see that in the Asian race is smaller than the Caucasian race, you know, so we have, and we have this, uh, actually India is the diabetes capital of the world, actually with more than uh, 35 million cases. And, uh, uh, so uh, I have this typical problem in the clinic, like we have 32 year old, like having already done two angioplasties, you know, with small kid. So I feel that uh, this kind of uh, technology, NRFTF technology will help this kind of patients a lot because uh, 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 surgery is no answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, John, we'll give it back to you. Okay, great. All right, next question, doctors. What are the pitfalls in current methods of diagnostic and treatment in cardiology, which has led to epidemic heart disease worldwide. Dr. Gordon, let's start with you on that. Well, first off, I touched on it with regard to the cholesterol testing. So many people do cholesterol testing, standard lipid profile where you get your LDL, HDL, triglycerides, uh, and, to and total cholesterol. And as I said, that's the 30,000 foot view. If you really want to get down to the nitty gritty about what's going on, you do what's called an advanced lipid panel that looks at that small dense LDL. It gives you an LDL particle number. It looks at the size of the HDL particles, which plays a role. It looks at some of the other um, lipid proteins as well, like um, APOE, um, lipoprotein A or LP little a, things like that, all of which carry their own risk for cardiovascular disease. And if you don't check for that in a standard lipid panel, you know, so many people come in with heart attacks and they said, well, gee, I had my cholesterol checked six months ago and my doc told me everything looked perfect. Well, if you look at the statistics of people that come in with a heart attack, over 50% of people that come in with a heart attack have what would be considered normal lipids. Normal cholesterol. Yeah. And so that doesn't really tell you the picture. The advanced lipid panel is one way to do that. But unfortunately, most insurance companies will not pay for that test to be done. And it's not cheap. It's anywhere from three to $500 to do that test. So that's a problem with our healthcare system in the United States is they aren't interested in prevention. They're, they aren't interested in, in spending the money on prevention. So lipid testing is, is one problem. Another problem is um, the best test to look to see if there's actually plaque in your artery is a coronary CT angiogram or a CAT scan of the heart where they uh, inject some dye into your vein in your arm. So it's not invasive other than just having an IV. But that really tells you the amount of plaque, the amount of blockage, and so forth. Uh, and again, most insurance companies won't pay for that test either. They'll pay for a stress test which has an accuracy in women of about 50% and in men about 65 to 70%. So it's wrong far too often, whereas a coronary CT angiogram accuracy is about 99%. So th those are kind of my personal pet peeves about, about diagnostic testing in cardiovascular disease. It's as if the insurance companies haven't kept up with the technology. We as preventive cardiologists, know what are the best tests to be done, but we can't get the insurance companies to cover them. And, and that's just a terribly frustrating position to be in. Because once we know what the actual breakdown, the nitty gritty of their lipids are, then we can tailor a therapy specifically directed to that individual as to what's gonna help get those lipid abnormalities corrected and in the right spot. And likewise, if you do a coronary CT angiogram on somebody, you know, they may have a plaque that causes a 30% blockage, but that would never be detected on a stress test. It's been the best stress test in the world. So if you have a normal stress test and you have normal lipids, you might say, oh, my heart's fine, I don't have anything to worry about. And then six months later, you have a heart attack and you go, oh my gosh, what happened? Well, it was probably because that 30% plaque that was missed on your stress test ruptured, caused a complete blockage and led to the heart attack. And so with the right type of testing, um, you can detect these things early, get them on a preventive protocol, and hopefully prevent that disastrous uh, event down the road. And Dr. Gandhi, I, I know that you've had some interest with um, some other diagnostic testing maybe you can talk about. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, Dr. Gordon rightly said that the standard care is not adequate and uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, reimbursement issues. Uh, I have been working with a special test which is known as the Pulse Test, which is Medicare reimbursed uh, here in United States. And it also gives you your heart age and it also uh, gives you a lot of information about uh, the risk factor or getting the uh, heart attack. What would be your risk in the coming five years, you know, so it helps you to prepare better. So I, I, I work with Dr. Harrington, who is uh, the uh, co-inventor co of this test. So, so there are interesting things out there, but you know, like uh, Dr. Mark, the usual problem is that uh, for prevention, people are always like, having lack of time or not willing to do and that is the reason why we are doing the science webinars because we really want to do our part best as doctors to reach out and share this information. Uh, uh, I have been fortunate, uh, I have done a lot of work with city coronary scan because in India uh, we can order CT scans and uh, because our outpatient practice is mainly cash so it becomes very good so I've been fortunate that I have been on the aggressive prevention side and people have cooperated and I've been able to detect people at uh, early stages uh, uh, of uh, the blockage and the biggest myth which uh, uh, is there uh, with the interventional cardiology with Dr. Mark would agree is that they, they always operate when the blockage is more than 70% and uh, obstructive because they say that uh, uh, lesser than that they can't do but majority of the heart attacks are happening in blockages less than uh, 70 percent you know and I think that is the biggest pitfall and that is the reason why uh, you know we are getting 525,000 new uh, like new cases you know because cases are being missed missed and people don't know they don't have this knowledge uh, then another another major pitfall what I see is that like there was this uh, courage trial which has clearly shown actually that optimum medical therapy if a patient is on a good medical management and cardiac rehab then doesn't need uh, they compared uh, with angioplasty who had done uh, they don't need the angioplasty if they do it but you know the problem with the americans is that they just want something to happen something to be fixed and i have i have actually met in fact a lot of cardiologists who don't want to do the procedures but you know it's like people are just like no i'm paying my insurance i'm paying this no, I have a message that okay, fine. Your insurance is going to pay you everything. You don't have to do anything. But what is happening to your body? You know, you're going and just like further rupturing the blockage and you know creating more inflammation and all those body mechanisms over there. So uh, uh, I think the mindset of the people have to change somewhere and come out of this uh, kind of uh, things that something needs to be fixed and focus more on technologies like NRF2, early detection and, and uh, proper diagnostics, what Dr. Gordon and we shared and uh, go on more natural methods. And uh, another treatment method which I have been working extensively uh, has been EECP, which is enhanced external counterpulsation therapy. So, which is also actually again US FDA approved, but unfortunately it is after bypass and angioplasty. But uh, in India, I could do it in patients who wanted to avoid that. Uh, so, uh, there is also amazing technology where you can open the collaterals of the heart naturally and uh, increase the blood supply to the heart. So, I think the message is very clear that bypass and angioplasty increase the blood supply to the heart. They do not uh, like it, it is there is no guarantee that you may not get a heart attack after doing that so uh, uh, if you just do natural methods and this then prevent yourself I think there's a far better way of managing a heart problem than going through the standard methods of doing it that's what is like I wish to share okay great John back great. To you. well it's obvious that both of you doctors are, are passionate about prevention and um, I want to ask about what is the new breakthrough in medical research, which according to, uh, to many published things, will actually revolutionize the field of preventive cardiology that you guys collaborate on. Yeah, so uh, as, as, we, as we discussed that, uh, we have the studies about NRF2 activation. And according to me, that is the greatest breakthrough. Because the way I look at it is that uh, 
uh, we had this entire era of cholesterol and statins you know the statins started uh, moving because uh, we always could show some numbers that what is cholesterol do a statin test and then again uh, i mean give statins and again see the numbers so the same way uh, the latest uh, breakthrough which is the nrf2 acti activation the studies have been done where you can measure oxidative stress before and uh, after the uh, nrf2 activation uh, takes place in your body uh, uh, after that again you can you know repeat uh, and measure your oxidative stress and it has been shown that uh, you it is possible now to lower your oxidative stress in a much more effective manner faster manner and which was never ever possible before in the history you know and that is what something has excited me because like from last 20 years i've been i've been working on on oxidative stress free radicals i also like uh, because one of the i've been one of the proponents of chelation uh, therapy which is also known to reduce uh, free radicals i've co-authored a book with dr alvin cranton who is one of the authorities in us for chelation has written book bypassing bypassing surgery uh, so i wrote the india edition with him so like i have i have worked a lot on finding methods to uh, combat free radicals and i feel that uh, the concept of giving vitamins is outdated it is not uh, it is weak and what we have found is very very potent it is like uh, uh, it's like a ferrari i would say <laughs> <laughs> yeah one of the problems with the standard therapies in cardiovascular disease is they don't address the underlying problem the thing that led to the plaque build up in the first place you know they treat the end result um, and when i first heard about nrf2 activation I was very intrigued because it was not something that I learned about in medical school or any of my advanced medical training. Um, but it's because NERF-2 was discovered in the mid-90s, and that's when the research really began. And now we're starting to get enough research behind NRF-2 that we're beginning to realize what a huge role it has uh, as far as prevention goes. And I think that's why Dr. Gandhi and I are so excited. So, you know, when I first heard about NERF-2, I said to myself, well, we've got the statin drugs for cholesterol, we've got plenty of blood pressure medications and so forth, but we don't have anything that gets to that root cause. We don't have anything that gets to the oxidative stress, yes. which is what causes the oxidation of the LDL, which causes the buildup of the plaque in the first place in the arteries. So wouldn't it be cool if we had a way that we could reduce that oxidative stress and reduce the likelihood of the LDL becoming oxidized and therefore leading to plaque formation and so forth? And so as I learned about NERF2, I dug deep into the literature. I started reading everything that I could about NRF2, not only with regard to cardiovascular disease, but also um, many, many other conditions. Because uh, yeah, a couple years ago, Time Magazine had a cover that said inflammation, and basically it's, they said it was the root cause or the contributing factor to so many different diseases that we know about. And if you look up oxidative stress, if you go to pubmed.gov and just type in the term oxidative stress, there's, I don't know, something like 200,000 articles associating it with oxidative stress with just about every disease on earth that you can imagine. And so reducing oxidative stress can have a beneficial effect, um, not only for cardiovascular health, but also for the entire health of your whole body. And unfortunately, the diets that we all eat are not adequate. I know that many of us who are on this call try to stick to a very good plant-based diet. And I try to stick to a Mediterranean diet as much as I can. I'm not a vegan. I, I think Dr. Gandhi is. Am, am, are you? Yeah, almost. <laughs> almost, okay. Well, I, I eat a lot of fish, a little bit of chicken. I, I cut out beef and pork uh, this January 1st, and so I've been feeling better. But you don't necessarily have to do that. There's healthy, uh, low inflammation diets or anti-inflammatory diets and so forth that are paleo as well. So I'm not here to push one specific diet on anybody. But I tell people, you know, if we all lived in the Garden of Eden and ate just the foods that were there, none of us would need anything further as far as supplementation or activation goes. But the reality is we don't. And the food that we're exposed to has been sprayed with all sorts of pesticides and things that are endocrine disruptors and cause other problems with inflammation and oxidative stress. So we need an additional boost. We need an additional advantage uh, that we can get 
by taking a plant-based uh, supplement that can cause that NRF2 activation. And so when I started reading all the studies uh, on this, I just got very excited and thought, this is something that we haven't tapped into. And now even the pharmaceutical companies are getting excited about it. And they're trying to basically recreate nature. Uh, we already have natural compounds that can activate NERF2, but they're trying to develop these synthetic com compounds that do the same thing. And why is that? Well, because pharmaceutical companies have to develop a new uh, unique chemical or unique compound so that they can patent it and then make all the money that they need to off the drug. So it's interesting that this technology started with a simple plant-based um, compound and now it's advanced to the point where drug companies are utilizing that technology and that baseline information that we have on the plant-based compounds to develop their own drugs to treat a variety of different health conditions that are associated with oxidative stress. Great. I have one more question for time tonight. And uh, if uh, Dr. Gandhi and Dr. Gordon would address this. Um, oxidative stress, as you mentioned, sounds like it's the root cause of many different health issues. Um, when, we, when we grow up, our, our genes, if we look at our, our ancestors and look at different things, you know, it's kind of exciting. Sometimes it's not exciting to think that, hey, my mom or my dad had this disease or my grandparents had this disease and guess what, it's coming down the pipe for me. How does this new technology with NERF2 affect uh, your gene expression? Well, that's a great question. Um, we talk a lot about this term called biohacking. Uh, and more specifically, nutrigenetics or nutrigenomics, which is, if you break that word down, nutra means nutrition, genomics means genes. It's the effect that nu nutrition, the foods that we eat, the supplements that we take, it's the effect that that has on the expression of genes. So as you said, John, we're all born with a certain set of genes. Some people may have the genetic susceptibility to, say, have colon cancer. Well, it used to be we thought that, you know, if you've got that genetic susceptibility, there's really not much you can do about it. But now we know that you can turn on and you can turn off certain genes. And so if you do have the genetic predisposition to, say, having colon cancer, eating the right things and taking the right supplements may turn those genes down or turn them off so they never get expressed and lead to the development of cancer. Uh, and, and that's just one example. There, there's numerous other examples where you can talk about activating the good genes and deactivating the bad genes. And that's what we're really doing with this NRF2 technology through nutrigenomics. And that's what's so exciting. You know, 15, 20 years ago, we never would have dreamed that we could do that with something as simple as a plant-based compound. But it turns out that, you know, nature perhaps may have the best pharmacy available to us if we would just utilize it and, and people are recognizing and discovering things all the time now uh, that can help us in the preventive world and I'm really excited about that. Yeah and mainly like uh, I have I come across a lot of people like you know whose parents have got a heart problem or they have died of heart disease and most of the times they are living it to fate you know oh like you know they had it I will get it and they become very laxed you know and they don't want to take preventive measures that living up to fate that anyways I will get it so I think this is a this is a great boon uh, for the people and I believe that uh, there is this WHO slogan which is uh, which is there that place uh, people's health in their own hands you know I think it's very powerful, you know, and I used to always wonder that how can you place people's health in their own hands, you know, but I feel with this uh, NRF2 uh, activation technology and the uh, plants based supplements, uh, which is so easy uh, for people that they can work and, you know, make good genes, like turn on good genes and control the uh, lot of oxidative stress, which relates to aging and heart problems and all. So we have got something amazing, which was never before. And I feel that it, it will empower a lot of uh, people around the world to take care of themselves. Yes, absolutely. Perfect. Well, prevention is better than cure, but no one walks the walk. Walk the walk on prevention. And <laughs> Dr. Gandhi, if you want to have your closing remarks on that. Oh, sure. Actually, yeah, because... Uh, uh, 
uh, working in prevention is uh, really sometimes gets frustrating, you know, because uh, you always I've given so many talks, I've lost count of it, done two millions, but. Uh, Mark has been lucky. They all come to him, and you know they are all in a rush, and they listen to him what he says because they are in emergency, so uh, they have no choice, you know. So, but if, when people come to us, they are not in emergency, right? So they want to stray around a lot. Anyways, but the point is that that's why I said that walk the talk. That uh, uh, the the point is that I feel that majority of the people are interested in prevention. and very few are committed to prevention now what i mean by that you know is like when you're interested in prevention you may do may not do or do what is easy and convenient you know but when you are committed to prevention you will do anything what it takes to prevent a problem you know and that's the difference so i'm hoping that the audience out here and all the wonderful people who have been listening to us and thanks for your time and what uh, like you know and we hope that me and dr gordon have shared whatever our experiences and knowledge with you will benefit you but walking the talk is that taking action being committed doing whatever it takes to uh, keep your heart healthy keep yourself healthy keep your family healthy keeping the people around you healthy and uh, 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 taking the steps which are necessary uh, uh, to achieve that uh, positive state of health you know so i think that uh, i would just uh, want everyone to awaken uh, to this wake up call by the two cardiologist out here and especially dr mark who has given up his cath lab and is dedicating most of his time for prevention uh, i really salute this great man uh, you know because we re, re, we america needs uh, doctors like him that's what i truly feel that um, who is reaching out to more and more people and i think uh, now uh, at least we all can sleep well at night you know that we are not giving the bad news but we are giving the good news that you can take care of your heart and you can take care of your health thank you so much thank you dr gandhi i just want to close with one thing the there's um a lot of truth to uh some old old chinese uh, medical texts and and i found this quote i'm going to read it to you it was from a first uh century no it was actually from 2600 bc the first chinese medical textbook that was ever written and here's what it said superior doctors treat the disease mediocre doctors treat the disease before evident inferior doctors treat the full blown disease So <laughs> is your doctor an inferior doctor, a mediocre doctor or a superior doctor? That's the question you need to ask yourself. Wow, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Great. Great. Well, I just want to say thank you for everyone for joining us tonight. Um please get back to the person uh that invited you this evening uh on this webinar for more information. Um as Dr. Gandhi and Dr. Gordon mentioned, uh a major breakthrough and we're very very excited. Thank you for joining us tonight and have a great evening. Thank, Thank you everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.